Hello and welcome to the Symposium podcast. My name is Jochem. I'm here with Nathan and Aisha. Oh, Aisha. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's not that special. Oh, it is special. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think many of you guys are familiar with me, uh, also not with the other persons, because they, you know, they don't even study philosophy, as you will find out. I am no. a philosophy major. I do a bachelor first year. Um, yeah. So what do you study, Nathan? Uh, me and Aisha, we both study uh, psychobiology in at the UvA. Yes, at the University of Amsterdam, and we're in our second year. So yeah. So you're very smart. <laughs> so smart. You're smarter than me in my first year of my. Dumb, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Stop so, being so self-deprecating. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. So today, uh, because I'm a philosophy major and you two are psychobiology or neuroscience major, I don't precisely know how you would say it. Probably both of them. Yeah. It's kind of the same. Um, yeah. I just I just wanted to discuss some things that maybe have some overlap. Uh, and I don't really have anything planned. Uh, and it's also not going to be a big debate where at the end philosophy wins or science wins and we will settle this dispute once and for all between <laughs> which is the superior one uh, that would be cool to do yeah. that would be cool to do <laughs> we can do that change next time change your plans <laughs> next time we will do that definitely okay. um, but now I just want to have some open topics so we were just kind of thinking what we could really what could we really discuss and I think a very interesting thing is mental illness uh, <laughs> interesting not fun interesting so uh we just want to discuss that. Uh, you were talking about schizophrenia before we started. Uh, was that me? I think it was, was uh, Aisha, oh, yeah. actually. Well, you sent us this video about um, this way of thinking, I think by Deleuze. Yeah, 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 Deleuze. That he thinks that thinking about politics or, or society in a schizophrenic way is like an interesting way to um, think about like new topics outside of like capitalism yeah outside <laughs> of what people are thinking about now like very specific topics that don't really mean much for the entire world you know mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah that was the point right i'm like it kind of yeah i don't even really get the lose myself i don't think anyone gets the lose <laughs> in philosophy oh. <laughs> if i'm honest i think what kind of the point was yeah uh so schizophrenic thinking is kind of this um way in which you have okay let me start at the beginning Yes. Yeah, specific levels. So at the beginning, uh, you just kind of have your body or your consciousness, I believe he says. Then you have your body, then you have um, society, then you have a larger structure, and then you have the actual world, which is kind of just, I don't know what it would precisely be for him, maybe the material conditions, something like that. Yeah. Just what the world is. And also just specific races and stuff. And we always kind of divide them up. We always say, okay, well, I can only, my thoughts are only in my head. Um, political uh, ideologies only exist in this specific sphere that I can't really access. And what schizophrenic people do is that they can kind of, through not being in this conventional mode of thought, yeah. um, connect them. So my thoughts are outside my head. Uh, uh, I have all these ideas about Jews and blah, blah, blah. I think that that's, <laughs> no, okay. Yeah, there was this quote. That is the <laughs> that's actually one thing. The example. Just, yeah, I give this example of a schizophrenic man who, um, he was like, he was like, I have a Jewish stomach? Something no, 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 no. It, it was uh, the surgeon had uh, fixed his stomach or something, or the doctors had inspected his stomach, and he thought that his stomach uh, disappeared every so often. Or every uh, time he was full, or every time he didn't eat, his stomach disappeared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it appeared again when he was hungry or something like that. Yeah, something like that. But then, uh, so the doctors went to inspect his stomach, and he said, well, uh, so my stomach wasn't there because my stomach isn't there. And then when they <laughs> operated, they found a fake stomach and they uh, replaced it with a, ju a faulty Jew stomach. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so that connects a lot of different levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of does in a sense, right? Yeah. So that your stomach can be actually replaced and that. Um, but I think what the main point is not so much about how, of course, how schizophrenic think as well. But what he kind of saw in schizophrenia, I believe, is that you have these new creative novel ways of thinking that are very hard to have when you are in this normal discursive yeah, mode where you separate 
the levels. Yeah. Uh, and that is actually like a force for good in a sense if you don't isolate it, if you don't yeah. understand it. For like creativity and thinking outside of certain like levels or boxes, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I remember Nathan that you were saying, well, I'm not so sure if it's actually so productive and well, creatively. Uh, not, not even that. I, I don't think it's limited to uh, schizophrenic thought. Like, uh, I think that, especially in the past, like if you bring race into it as a separate level and uh, that's incorporated into things and that makes, so his stomach is a Jew stomach and therefore dysfunctional. I don't think that's, something that would be seen as completely illogical at all times like at at this time it is less usual to uh, take race into something and therefore describe it as bad but at that time i don't think it was unusual to call something jewish and then bad yeah. i don't know if that was particularly revolutionary uh, of that <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> because there was probably already this climate of anti-semitism and yeah. it was just like oh my stomach doesn't work it must be the jews and <laughs> yeah kind of yeah probably it was kind of at the beginning of the 20th century so maybe you think that example isn't that creative or no, that <laughs> no, no but i also think that in conventional thought it is usual to uh, take different levels uh, and connect them yeah but i do like understand what he means by that schizophrenic people or people who think more unconventionally that they make associations that people usually would not because i think how schizophrenia works or how we kind of learned it once is that they have like higher levels of dopamine so when they're for instance when they're like driving in a car and they see a car behind them normal people just be like oh there's a car okay and focus on something else but because of their high dopamine levels they make associations that are really drastic that maybe like two things that have nothing to do with each other to like um stimuli but they connect them and and their like consciousness like makes all these connections and that don't really happen as quickly with like norm not normal you know conventionally thinking people yeah oh they also show the this computer model right where they uh like this computer model was able to identify or perceive things that came into it but then they were able to jerk up like the association of dogs and then oh, everything yeah. in the picture like the face of people turned into dogs the hands of the people turned into dogs yeah and that's it was also what very happens trippy that's what happens to people on like lsd as well yeah right? i was just about to say yeah yeah so it. you're like the the associations you project onto your uh, perception like increase mm -hmm. so basically like people think that's also kind of how schizophrenia works and that's why they can create like associations between very random things, such as Jew and stomach and it disappearing, or you know, like the level of the world to the level of a person to the level of politics, and connect all those things, and maybe to those things that <coughs> by thinking that way, apart from just rationally thinking, you can just like come to new insights that you usually would never, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean, but that's really that's really interesting because I had I, I had been thinking lately about different ways of thinking in general, and you have kind of this discursive way uh, of I don't know just quantifying things, having these logical systems that work normally, um, but you also have kind of this poetic way of thinking, which is something that a lot of philosophers emphasize or at least that's what i emphasize and which <laughs> that i read in philosophers i guess someone like heidegger uh we don't know uh, maybe you do actually the, name, the word the word i've heard of the name <laughs> i've heard of the name <laughs> <laughs> you maybe know plato no who is that I have no, clue. <laughs> no so uh yeah he probably would also emphasize kind of this poetic way of engaging with the world that is not just scientific but what you just said about making these random creative associations yeah. that is kind of what that entire mode of creative thinking. creative thinking and all is kind of about i yes. feel like when i'm making a song or i'm playing music i play a chord and then i play another chord and then i'm like oh but i maybe could do this and then kind of you know this whole thing unfold yeah. in this kind of associative way of thinking that just unfolds instead of me being deliberately yes shaping it so maybe schizophrenia is just creativity <laughs> <laughs> yeah but what's also interesting is that um i mean 
I'm sh maybe you even send me this uh, that uh, children's brains behave the same as people on shrooms or something. Seriously, on I don't LSD, remember. because like their uh, connections are still very weird. They haven't been trimmed down. Is yeah. the current uh, theory? Uh, so they just have very random associations. Maybe also like someone who is schizophrenic. Yeah, which is weird. I mean, people say that like when like children are full of imagination, and then you become an adult and you're just worrying or whatever. It doesn't yeah. have to be the default. But that's what people think. No, if you have you schizophrenia, <laughs> exactly, you stay young forever <laughs> mentally. <laughs> that's the go-to youth. <laughs> that's the go-to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're all eating grapes right now. Yeah, we are grapes. <laughs> Wait, schizophrenic thinking. <laughs> we are grapes. Mm, that would be very nice indeed to be a grape. Yeah, but you, I, I did tell you about that. But there's all these, there's also also all these new age ways of thinking, which I don't know if I agree with, but it is kind of interesting. Oh, it's just kind of this um, this saying. I don't know who said it. Um, so the waters in which the psychotic drowns are the same waters in which the enlightened swims in the light, you know? Oh. So in the sense that kind of these weird associations and schizophrenia in itself is kind of this unbridled, godly divine power. Yeah. But there's this weird, yeah, but it's actually a weird thing. I've actually read that as well. That a lot of people with schizophrenia do a lot of the time also have these divine imagery in their own, um, in their own baanbeelden. What's it called? In their own... Psychoses. In their psychoses. Thank you very much yeah. <laughs> for all the non-Dutchies. Mm -hmm. There was just an error of translation going on. Um, yeah. Which was swiftly fixed. But I was, also, I was on, the, um, on, a, on the terrace once and I was drinking a beer with some friends. And there's just this guy came up to us and he was just like, can I get some money? And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, I, usually I give them some money, but, but I also want to talk with them. I want to know What's going Understand on? Understand them. Yeah, I'm kind of just like this egotistic prick who's like who wants to get the stories of other people so I can understand more of humanity and share them on a podcast. And, <laughs> precisely. This is I, podcast material. <laughs> I can modify them. That's indeed what I do. So I was just talking to him, and I was just like, "Oh, why are you on the streets?" And he was like, "Yeah, you know, um, my house, my mortgage wasn't really working that well, and I had to be set up my house. But you know, I'm the creator, so it's very weird." I was like, "Okay, wait." Did you just say you're already creator? It was like, yeah, 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 I'm God. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. But I, I guess it kind of happens apparently a lot with people who are in these kind of weird mental states that they just go to places where they uh, see themselves as divine. Yeah, that's weirdly also uh, true for bipolar disorder, um, that many times they feel like they have some divine or some, uh, not, maybe not divine, but like a very strong feeling that they suddenly have a life goal, maybe given to them by God, maybe not. Yeah. Uh, and that they pursue relentlessly only to, um, yeah, sell their house and uh, st you mean start like a new in business. states of mania, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, because isn't it the case that with bipolar disorder, when they're in states of mania, their dopamine is also higher? Also, current theory, but also. Yeah. Uh, which I want to mention for uh, schizophrenia as well. Both uh, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia are also thought to be autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases? Yes. That's very interesting. Yeah. Mm. Okay, let's talk about Wim Hof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? No, but honestly, because he also talks about how he can actually um, solve these immune disorders. For anyone who doesn't know, Wim Hof is this crazy ice man who does to his breathing technique at least uh, according to himself. No, no, uh, f first focus on the, the flashy parts of him. What did he do? What did he do? Oh yeah, he climbed Mount Everest uh, in his shorts, but everybody knows this guy. And because he says that he can influence his autoimmune system in such a way that he can also oh, regulate his right. cardiovascular system. And, and also the parasympathetic uh, and uh, sympathetic. Yeah. So the but you know, and there's actually studies that prove that he can and that other people can as well. So that would be very like revolutionary in mental health if that actually all worked out eventually. Yeah, that, that would be very interesting to look at, actually. Because, yeah, mm -hmm. like, biologically, it seems so unlikely that what he does, like, has an effect on... Anything. On, yeah, exactly. But it does. 
<laughs> Let's breathe the pain away, boys. <laughs> yeah, it is very weird, but apparently it does work, at least for for a lot of people. It, it is funny to hear him talk about it though because he doesn't get any of, of it and he's like <laughs> yeah this biologic stuff yeah we do this it's proven <laughs> it's real yeah yeah yeah. i had doctors yeah no but he's just very passionate about it and he does he does explain it the, as well as he can yeah. yeah and he's a very enthusiastic guy but he as well again has this kind of weird divine uh, inspiration yeah. Why is it always with these guys that they're always chasing after God or chasing after some godly ideal? Well, maybe they're in light. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> it, it, could, it could be. It could also just be that if you have um, that kind of, you think you have that, maybe you are just much more driven. So you are much more likely to uh, achieve such things. Mm. Yeah. So you think that. Um, this kind of divine inspiration is just a not really a construct but like an entity that exists in our own mind that we then can use as kind of a, a tool for growth could, could very well be i mean i don't think anyone uh, any person that would not have the divine inspiration would think let's climb mount everest in just my shorts <laughs> maybe <laughs> there are also I, some... I think like people it's like simple and okay to just like live a life without like thinking too much about what is behind life what is behind you know should i look further should i explore like why why i'm here who i am you don't like need to think that far you can just like you know live your life and, and yeah. stuff but some people you know think like way beyond that and that's why i guess it's some how kind of a drive because you want to like understand, right? Yeah, I think so as well. But on the other hand, it's not even really about thinking because this kind of um, spiritual connection that you could have with specific actions that you do, a lot of the time rely on felt experience. So for example, I I'm not saying I'm, I'm <laughs> enlightened or whatever, but <laughs> sometimes when you walk through the forest, everybody's had this or you had the bad day or whatever, and then you see all these beautiful flowers and these beautiful birds going around and you see this connectedness of everything. You really feel kind of this surge of this, I would say, poetic energy flowing through you that can really transform you and can motivate you in a specific way. So if you say that God is this specific entity, that will seem a bit weird because maybe these people just have had a specific experience that is actually a lived experience that we cannot explain um, merely via, I don't know. At least not yet. At I least mean, not yet. Oh no, no don't no. come with the no. no. <laughs> no, no. We can, I, I just we can find it's, this. It's, it's, I, I just think we don't yet know where the, um, the boundary lies uh, of what could be explained biologically. I, I don't think everything could be uh, explained biologically, but I think a lot more could be explained biologically than we currently think. Mm, that's mm. always the case. But on the other hand, mm, it's really hard. So, okay, I th we, we have always already been talking about this before the podcast, that words and language are really limited in order to describe a lived experience of a person. When yeah, I say I I'm angry or I'm happy, there is so there are so many feelings and sensations and things going on and variables at play that I cannot yeah. name in such a way that it seems very unlikely that we as human beings will be able to uncover the depth of what yeah. emotion actually is, even in words alone to describe what we feel. Because communication and only goes so far. Like we made it up to try to communicate knowledge and what we feel. But yeah, like it's our own interpretation of our abstract thinking. What do you mean with interpretation of abstract thinking? Well, I don't know. I think about this sometimes, like for instance, like animals, like dogs and stuff, they I feel like they have consciousness, but they don't think in language or words. So they don't have like that, that kind of communication to the outside world. So they don't, they're not like when they're aggressive or when they're happy, they don't think in those boxes because they don't have language for that. Mm. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but. No, I get what you mean. But like we put that on ourselves with the way we communicate to each other. But yeah, it doesn't, and I, th I think it also d differs per culture, right? Like what boxes exist for emotion, emotion. Yeah. yeah. 
Sure. Yeah, I don't know. I'm from a different culture. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Every culture is different. Every culture is always different. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of discussion about what are the basic emotions and what emotions are culturally uh, yeah. put upon us. And but that seems weird that you could have emotions that exist on the basis of your situation. Because it just seems that the situation kind of makes you feel in a certain way. But that's not always true. No, it's like, env I believe envy is not a thing in many cultures. Envy is not a thing in many cultures. The word. What is your source? <laughs> no, no, no. But that's that's one of the emotions we have, right, in the West. Mm -hmm. And in many, uh, that is not one of the basic emotions, I believe. I don't have a source. Don't <laughs> ask. <laughs> yeah. Some psychology book. But like, yeah, I love psychologists trying to find like the what are the basic emotions across every culture in every language. Mm -hmm. So which is based on language per culture, and. There are like a lot of different theories, like happy, angry, sad, happy, angry, sad. This and that. There's Disgust. like twelve different like ways of thinking about it. Yeah. And there's not one right way. So like it's true that. Yeah, we don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything about it actually. That's a stupid answer. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> we don't know shit. <laughs> I, have, I have a cool question. Is boredom an emotion? Or is it an absence of emotion and stimulation? I think it's an emotion. I also think so. Because it's kind of like a longing to like want to do something, but... Well, it's such a uh, stupid emotion. I have a longing <laughs> to long. <laughs> That's kind of what it is. Desire right? for desire. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. It's... Well, sometimes you are bored, but you do have a desire to do something. Mm, That's true, actually. They have different kind of boredom. Yeah. You have the boredom where you're lethargic, where you're lying in your bed, like, I want to do something, but I don't want, but I don't really and have the motivation mother, yeah. to do anything. And you can also be trapped with, I don't know, uh, but, well, <laughs> I don't know where the <laughs> sentence is going. But, but could you trapped also, in your room. But, but could you not also say that uh, in a way you are trapped when you are lying in bed and uh, thinking, I want to do something. And... Um, I mean, in a way that is being trapped, it's not physically or like by outside uh, forces, but by inside forces. Yeah, I think what, when people ask like, oh, how do you feel? You can say, I feel bored. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, I don't know. So there's different kinds of boredom as well. Maybe in some languages, there's two different terms for it. <laughs> like in Russian, there's two terms for uh, blue. Wow. Light blue and dark blue. <laughs> Whoa. I know that one is actually Galuboy, and I found that very funny. Galuboy. <laughs> Galuboy. Let's go. Let's get him. <laughs> what? Let's get what? The color? <laughs> <laughs> let's get the color right now. Galuboy. <laughs> color Galuboy. Mm, yeah, basically. But I, I, there's this thing from Heidegger. Once again, I'm not completely uh, read up on this, but that boredom is kind of this very profound emotion. We have immediate, for him, that means uh, immediate um, interaction or immediate access to being. And being is a very, uh, I guess, abstract term at this point. And it's really hard to define what he means by it as well. But it's kind of just the entire existence or um, string or uh, multiplicity of phenomena that we find ourselves in right now. And when you're bored, you kind of can see the things as they really are. Because you're not blind. <laughs> I don't know. If you mean because you're point. not blinded by by know. angriness or happiness or. But sad. I don't know if that is his point, actually. But no. I, I still feel like boredom is. It sounds dumb. It sounds very dumb. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't because know. you can be bored and feel depressed. But you can also be bored and be content with. It. Or is boredom always a negative thing? That's a good question. Uh, I've hung out with you before with Nathan. And I was a bit Felt bored, bored. <laughs> but I was also content at the same time. I was just yeah. like, ah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> because you saw things the way they were. That's <laughs> fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> and it was good. Yeah, I don't really think that is actually what he meant. <laughs> but it's <laughs> what Heidegger meant. When you are with a friend <laughs> and, you're, and you're bored, you see. But it's nice. <laughs> you see, you see your friend for what he really is. <laughs> boring. <laughs> Maybe that 
that was his point. <laughs> Maybe that was My friends are point. boring. Yeah, I don't know. We're, we're doing a philosophy podcast and I'm just quoting philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't really know what he said. Let me like kind of make it you know, <laughs> as we go along. No, no, no. No. But for anyone who's interested in that, you can. There's a lot of philosophers who've actually written on boredom. Uh, but I've, I've been kind of getting into it, but I'm, I'm not. Thinking. If you actually want to know, look it up. <laughs> Don't listen to this podcast. <laughs> Just leave. Well, listen to it and then think, wow, this was bullshit and <laughs> look it up. <laughs> Precisely. I think it's actually kind of a phenomenologist. So, hey. Wait, let's go over on the phenomenology. Go over on phenomenology. <laughs> go over on phenomenology. What do you want to talk about? Well, expl- explain. <laughs> it. We actually don't really understand it, so could you please explain it to us? Yeah. So the way that I understand phenomenology is basically um, okay. Let me do it with an example of what is not phenomenology first. That makes it more clear, at least for me. All right. Uh, so when you have a scientific way of looking at the world, you have, let's say, a chair. Uh, you can say, oh, what is it made of? Well, this chair is here made of a bit of steel and it's made of wool and it's, uh, it weighs, I don't know, probably like three kilos or whatever, something like that, maybe a bit more. Uh, and then you kind of have described it in scientific terms. You've kind of put this theory on top of the phenomena that you have. So that's kind of the key word. It is on top or it is kind of a way in which you can interpret phenomena. So. What phenomenology it kind of is, is getting away or getting rid of those uh, theories that you have, this quantifying, and yeah. try to really explain or describe the phenomena precisely as they are. So to like break it down into its components. But not break it down. That's precisely the point maybe, oh. that they do not want to make. Okay. Uh, because breaking down in its components would again be a scientific way of looking at it. Yeah. So the point is not really that you break it down uh, into specific components. Uh, that's not really precisely true. I think you can't really escape it when you do language, because every time you try to write it down, you exactly break it down into components so that people understand it. Yeah, when you start to describe an object or mm-hmm. something you see. Yeah, maybe more so what my uh, what my gut reaction was, is that in a sense, it maybe tries to connect all phenomena as kind of this meaningful whole. It's kind of a holistic approach to uh, existing or to being in the world or to being a consciousness or whatever. I guess I'm now more so talking from Heidegger's perspective because I know the most about it. I don't know much about Husserl. That's another name. That's kind of his teacher. And there's a bunch of other people who came afterwards, like Melo-Ponty. This is French dude. And he talked a lot about embodiment. Um, yeah, but what I find interesting is that this is, that this is something that has been taking up into psychology a lot. But you do, you guys do neuroscience, and that is kind of the most quantifying way to look at a human being and to look at emotion and behavior. Well, and yeah, yeah. Well, behavior and emotion are precisely, according maybe to phenomenologists, um, things that you can't that cannot. Quantify. You, yeah, you can't quantify them, or at least when you quantify them, you diminish what you actually understand about them. Yeah, yeah. And I feel that too in like more psychological um, research. You like try to um, quantify things by asking questions in a survey and stuff, but it's very hard to, or I think it's like difficult to like really truly validify those ways of quantifying mm-hmm. someone's thoughts or emotions because like they'll they will like interpret their own emotions in their own way and it's subjective and and like everyone is thinks differently, but they all answer the same question and we just put them into one category yeah and i mean you feel that too right when you're filling in a a questionnaire or something yeah that often you're not like oh yeah i feel this way it's like no i can talk for an hour about how i feel about this (laughs) yeah i can't i can't give it one to five no it doesn't really make much sense i need to do these surveys I, i don't even know what they really um what do they really accomplish okay yeah i so, think the like goal is to get an average so like the thing with science is that they try to get like the data of as many people as possible to have like the mean and that's what they base like their hypothesis off of but but what do you really measure then you just measure kind of symptoms i feel well but- that's that's also the funny thing uh that we all uh we have 
learned a lot about is that uh, quite often uh, certain experiments or uh, especially into behavior, they uh, measure something and then they say, okay, that is this concept. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're just measuring this concept. While when you look into it, uh, most of the time, you can really doubt that they are actually measuring that exact construct. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to validify the way they quantify um, sadness or just like very ab abstract concepts. Yeah. And that's also uh, why every 20 or 30 years, uh, all terms in uh, cognitive science change <laughs> yeah. uh, their meaning. Like yeah. uh, short term memory now means something completely different from uh, like 30 or 40 years ago. What did it what did it used to mean? Well, that's what we it used to mean what we speak about in daily use, like mm -hmm. something that happened not too long ago. While now that is considered working memory, right? Yeah. So uh, what we talk about in short term memory is just like maybe what was it 10 seconds after the fact yeah well i thought that working memory is short-term memory but they call it working memory now it's yeah yeah but the short-term memory is still a construct but it's way shorter oh okay. it's like way shorter yeah no it's like short term as in five seconds how is that even memory <laughs> well that <laughs> is just well <laughs> it's like that's why it's called working memory now because it's like what you basically what you're thinking about what you, what is in your head kind of at the moment mm -hmm. That's working memory. And things from long-term memory move into working memory when you think of them. Yeah. But that's the current uh, concept. Yeah, but the point is that like paradigms change all the time. And that's also like the thing with science that people are always like, whoa, science is reality. Science is like the, yeah, the truth, no. but it changes But it but doesn't so even make much. any sense if you really think about it. Science is reality. Well, I, I don't experience atoms or... No. That's a very shitty <laughs> argument. No, no I understand. <laughs> I'm like... If we create, we like, we like made that whole construct of like the, the elements table and all that. Like we, we made those boxes be based on our observation. But like, I also like think about like, what if there was another universe or another world with like highly intelligent beings and they also started trying to like use induction and deduction to understand their world, like in a similar way. But they, like, made up a completely different way of, like, understanding how things are. Which is, like, just as valid as our way of how we see the world with atoms. And uh, these, like, 150, whatever, different was, kind of specific elements and stuff. Yeah, I thought it, I was thinking about it as well, indeed. But, like, even maybe even more radical. Because you talked about, like, induction and deduction. And that still presupposes these kind of logical, mathematical rules. Yeah. But who says that they need to have the same kind of logic that functions in the same way where you, for example, no. have like the principle of no contradiction, something cannot be P and not P at the same time. That can be completely different. Yeah. So in that way, they can have this view of reality, uncover reality in a way that seems to us like magic, impossible. But there are all these different ways in which you could maybe uh, like actually engage with reality where some people can do things that are just very magical and mystical to us. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. I, could, I really wonder what like, how we view the world and our like scientific um, knowledge, how that will be viewed from an outside perspective. Cause like- From what, a cow? <laughs> from, yeah, how, it like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I don't know, like if we look back like a thousand years ago when people thought the, or some people thought the sun revolved around the earth and stuff, they mm -hmm. really thought that and they believed that was like the truth and that was just like their way of thinking about the world. But now we like think all these things and we're like, yeah, this is the truth, you know? But in a thousand years, people are gonna be like, oh, remember when we thought this and this about like, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> remember when we thought experience was in the brain? <laughs> <laughs> Cringe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I feel like, take it back to phenomenology maybe, kind of, if you would take things at face value, um, so for example, I do think the sun revolves around the earth because that's what i see you know then we would have never known otherwise if we just said oh we should only do phenomenology phenomenological research but in a way kind of doing scientific research also 
uh, affects the way that phenomena appear to us. Because if I see the sun, I actually experience it as something that is still, but we kind of revolve around. Yeah, kind because of, of your knowledge way. of how that works. But that's weird because I do experience it as kind of an actual fact. As like, I see it just as I experience love or an emotion, you know, even yeah. though it is something I could not know by looking at it. So maybe phenomenology and science are not so distinct after all. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> so basically that the worldview has like such an impact on your way, on your own experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So we just kind of, refuted my hypothesis in <laughs> the beginning that it's <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with it. So science and philosophy it. are in fact equal. Are they? <laughs> do they do they feed into each other and change each other in many different and multiple ways? <laughs> this is a very yeah. revolutionary <laughs> But that's also like interesting with people who are uh extremely religious. Mm -hmm. Like they have well like I'm personally not religious but it's just interesting to me because they have such such a different worldview. Like, or like, I don't know, just, you know, I don't know where <laughs> well, Do you mean by worldview, uh, a religious different worldview in the sense that they just, also about ethics, morality, about whatever? Yeah, like, if they look at, at the sky, they like, f probably feel an experience of like, oh, I, God. I, I, God, or I don't know, whatever it is, spirituality, and like, yeah, I just think phenomenology is probably extremely subjective. And like, what is, well, can you like give an example of describing the chair with phenomenology? <laughs> well, no, the, the phenomenology That's... is more your experience of the chair. So it's like, so it's like, right? It's, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> I guess it's uh, what, it, what it really uh, is also a lot about is describing the meaning of things uh, in relation to each other. So, okay. Let me say this more clearly and let me try to not mess it up. I think what it is, is that you experience the world, not as kind of these individual objects, but it appears to you as kind of a, a meaningful whole where things exist as meaningful, maybe in relationship to each other. So like a chair only exists as a meaningful thing because I can sit on it, but I immediately grasp that without having to think about it. I can just immediately do it again. This is much more Heidegger than other phenomenologists, but you know, there are overlaps uh, between that. Um, so you kind of describe things as meaningful, that appear to you meaningful directly in relationship to the other things that exist in it uh, and uh. how you interact with it intuitively. Because I interact intuitively with a lot of things. Like we've been eating grapes right now. I'm not thinking, ooh, what is that? Oh, I have to think about it. Oh, it has a specific color and it has a specific weight. Oh, it must be a grape. How, what do I do with grapes? Oh, I eat them. No, you just intuitively understand the meaning of grapes of that they're food uh that they're in the middle of us now that we can yeah. share them and blah 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 stuff like that but again it isn't so different or distinct from science or the refuting of science if we think because that's what Husserl said uh he said oh we need to have this kind of first philosophy where we first describe everything phenomenologically before we can do science because otherwise you don't know what it means for our consciousness and then we just have a vague idea of what objects actually are but science, as we just saw, actually also influences the way we see phenomena, even though we're not consciously thinking about those ideas. And yeah. it's still like a meaningful thing in relation on the basis of our scientific frameworks. Yeah. So it's kind of like, um, you can kind of make an analogy with how, when you like look with your eyes, you can- <laughs> <laughs> Normally I look with my mouth. <laughs> no, you know, when you look with your eyes specifically. No, but you like get all these, you get this perception, this raw perception, and your brain like has these different stages of um, from there. Uh, processing. Yes. <laughs> Whoa, English, processing that information. Like first there's like the orientation of the lines and the color and the, the um, shading and all that. And that, that all goes like, uncon that all happens unconsciously. Mm -hmm. um, and we just perceive that as, as whatever it is. And we just, we're just like, oh, it's great. But actually, there are also all these like steps that happen before that. Oh, you mean in the visual cortex? Yeah. To come back to it. Oh wait, that was before the. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Inside jokes. <laughs> yeah, but 
But yeah, yeah so can basically, you describe, okay, describe these layers fr uh, from what we've learned. What can you do that? Okay. <laughs> well, you first just, just you first just have like uh, the single receptor that uh, like gets. Oh, there is light in here. I get activated or something to that nature, and that then signals it to another cell, which uh, is connected to multiple receptors, and that cell only fires when certain amounts of uh, receptors and certain kinds of receptors fire. So that then uh, goes to the next uh, step. And you, in these receptors, you must think about orientation of uh, objects. So is it straight? Is it slightly bent? Is it color? Uh, color is also a big one. Um, loads of uh, concepts. Yeah, so basically your brain also starts by looking at specific components and in your consciousness you like end up perceiving that as just what it is mm. so maybe then the basis of consciousness is phenomenology so you just you see it as what it is and then we start start breaking it down again in in science so it's it's just a very reductive uh, way of <laughs> I science guess. or like yeah. i guess the points of like that was the, that is kind of the point of phenomenology it's not the point of phenomenology i don't know i'm not really speaking for no, anyone right exactly. now <laughs> yeah we us the our <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah uh, one big idea is yeah we um so basically just like using your own consciousness as what it was like kind of built for just like s taking things as you perceive them yourself instead of trying to um look at it rationally and logically and like breaking the part like oh this is a chair because of this and this and this but just being like oh it's a chair i can sit on it yeah you know you don't even think about it but yeah. i think it's interesting what you just said about the brain where kind of these neurons and all these things interact with each other in a specific way to create a specific frame i feel like that in a sense also mimics kind of meaning systems that we have in real life so in one way it's not really reductive because reductive kind of means okay you have one thing that we want to discuss and then we'll just divide it up in the system and then it's just it kind of just trickles down it's kind of a tree you know so i have like one principle goes into two goes into four goes into eight but kind of what you can do uh, especially when you think about the brain it's kind of this thing that completely interacts with each other and every aspect needs each other in order to actually work in a certain sense so there is kind of a parallel that you can make between phenomenology where it says oh everything exists in this kind of coherent whole with the way that we as our brain and the kind of our modes of creating reality if you believe that we create reality with our brains this is a whole different discussion <laughs> it kind of mimics it it's kind of the same it's kind of the same way in which everything actually interacts so i don't maybe it isn't even really a reduction maybe it's just kind of uh, something it's a reduction in the sense that you need to use language to describe it you can't immediately formulate or understand the brain just by looking at it oh yeah oh yeah i get it now yeah. <laughs> I, I, that, that's not how it works no you need to break it down, of course, or at least uh, categorize it, but then you can still have kind of this nice coherent system that functions. Yeah, it's pretty like interesting or paradoxical anyway that we as humans are trying to understand our own brains by using our brains. <laughs> it's not really paradoxical, but it's a bit, it's a bit weird. But it's like kind of like a tease, you know? Yeah. And it's, <laughs> oh, like we were thinking so hard about it our with brain our is brains. Like, oh, let's try to understand myself, but I'm going to completely make myself <laughs> yeah. un understandable in the process. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a bit of an asshole move. Really. <laughs> so this other thing that we were also discussing, which is kind of related to this, um, not right now we were discussing it, but uh, some time ago, and it was about uh, child development and about understanding. And I feel like there was this very interesting uh, thing that you said about um, memory, because there's this kind of well-known phenomena that around four, uh, you kind of lose all your memory, or at least you don't know anything before your fourth birthday. Yeah. Nobody knows it. And it's kind of this mystery why it actually happens. And we were yeah. kind of talking about understanding and why that could be, or if it's actually forgetting at all. Yeah. Well, I, I don't perceive it as forgetting. I just feel like you start, um, like, holding memories as soon as you're like, around three and four. And, like, the way I, I thought about it or interpreted it was, like, the way if we, like, experience things right now and create memories right now, we're basically, like, 
taking perception and projecting our own past experiences and thoughts and memories and basically who we are onto the perception of what we are experiencing right now and um, that gets taken into our like memory processing and that creates a new memory and that gets forgotten or like goes into long-term memory or whatever but i feel like the, that process of uh projecting your own ex past experiences onto what you're experiencing right now like it has to start somewhere because mm -hmm. you don't have you have not experienced anything when you're two weeks old you know so you don't you there's not a lot of material to interpret your current like being with well but i mean you would have to remember something right because how could you otherwise build up the experience to um have four memories if yeah. you don't remember it yeah so it's like hard to say like when does that start but i feel like maybe the reason most people start remembering like their first memories out two three four years old is maybe because they have enough past experiences and like s slightly an idea of like them because i feel like who you are is like based on all your memories right and like how that affects your way of thinking and all that but basically like when you're around three or, or whatever you have enough um reference to interpret and to like remember those interpretations but it's like hard to say when that starts actually well but a thing that is true is that toddlers do remember things and that's yeah i mean maybe it isn't as much that they forget things indeed but no. more that the memory becomes inaccessible yeah as in it is not in a shape that is usable in the adult brain yeah but what like why does that start happening from around four years old is it inaccessible because it's too malleable because they don't have enough experience like that's how i like that's like my theory about it but i'm not yeah, sure if there's I, actually like studied I, 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 <laughs> I have not looked anything up so. I, I thought that <laughs> i've not been uh, around enough uh, four-year-olds uh, recently to uh, <laughs> confirm nor deny that's uh, that's very soothing to hear um <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, but uh, I just I, I kind of want to go into what you just said, uh, yes. but like in like a very specific part, because you said that you think this is kind of related. You said that you think that a person ex uh, exists as a person on the basis of the memories that he has, or experiences, or experiences. Yeah. But I feel like there's more to it than that. I feel like yeah. the way that you, as a human being, live is also really constituted by the experiences that you have not had. In the sense that oh. I live now in a specific present moment where there are all these material conditions and psychological conditions and I have had my past memories. But for example, the, the present can change the past. So I don't know, for example, I think you're very nice, but then now in the moment you're kind of stabbing me in the back, literally with a knife. Uh, and then you, you have in the past literally almost stabbed me in the neck with a knife yeah, yeah. <laughs> as a joke <laughs> let's that's... not get personal about it. <laughs> but that's not relevant right? like, let's, <laughs> but let's say you were trying to kind of trying to seduce me in a specific moment with a knife <laughs> <laughs> no Things let's say no, yeah. Yeah. okay let's leave out the knife for now you were trying to seduce me in the past uh, and then now you're that is a fact you are stabbing me uh, and they're like, oh, you're just seducing me to stab me. Well, in that moment, I was yeah. just like, oh, dear Nathan, you just want to, yeah. you want to, you want to give me a peck on the cheek, you know, something like that. But so, what I mean by that is like that that current moment is another experience when, one second ago, you know? I guess, but then I want to go further, is that you're, um, ah, I guess maybe you are right. Okay, so you have your <laughs> past experiences and your current experience and they interact with each other, but you also have experience that you have not had yet. Yes. And the ones that you want to have, or the things that you aim at, in the specific sense, also change uh, your current state and your past state. So in that sense, you're not kind of this wow. being that exists right now with a bank of memories and then he acts upon that. There's this kind of vast expanse of time in which he always exists, but the present is the only one you materially or like uh, perceive at a specific moment yeah. but they always change you they always interact you and you always live across time instead of at just one moment yes but it's oh. but 
how to take that back to children. <laughs> because may... that's what we want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we just want to talk about children. That's indeed an uh, interesting question. Yeah. Wait, so, but I do feel like when you think about the future, or when you like, it's like, oh, what do you want for the future or, or plan for the future? Don't you like think about that as a person, as your own personality based on your past experiences? And of course, like personality is also determined by nature, I guess. But mm -hmm. but also by nurture. But also by nature. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I never really got that nature and nurture uh, kind of distinction because you can never they never exist separately. No. Well, that's fine. They also, I would say there's always an interaction. So. I feel like it's weird to say that nature and nurture are distinct uh, in the sense that some people say about specific phenomena, oh, that's just nature. Oh, that's just nurture, you know, the way that people, uh, the way that people act. So, for example, you have a specific cultural way in which people exist uh, and which they, I don't know, some people eat a lot of baguettes. Uh, I don't know which country would do that, but let's say... <laughs> Who would eat baguettes? <laughs> Who would eat baguettes? There's one country famous for eating a lot of baguettes. Uh, stupid example but in a sense you can't really say that it's just oh but that's just nurture they just have kind of this they have just uh the situation around them that makes them want to eat a lot of baguettes and blah blah, blah. <laughs> 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 okay let's cut this out again. No, no, no. <laughs> keep going keep going keep going with the baguettes analogy <laughs> this is great but i feel like there's also definitely no, genetic because, interaction. Because, no, no, because you need to. The baguette gene. Let's say you the need. To, you need to eat as a specific. You need to eat as a person. You know, you need to have. There's these specific material conditions around you as well. With them, with them, we nurture again, and then you have kind of this process of nature and nurture existing together, creating all these specific um, cultural differences. But it doesn't make any sense that to say that culture is nurture and nature is kind of just the way you were born, because yeah. I cannot exist separately and uh, uh they just they they just change each other actually yeah i think yeah. that's also part of a uh, cultural like anthropology or no sorry evolutionary anthropology so like the idea that culture is kind of a like um a gene as well a, a type of gene well, that gets passed on through communication i think they call that memes uh yeah <laughs> i mean memes do yeah. that as well like the way memes go viral how those how specific memes get chosen and those go viral instead of other memes like, but it is because they are fitter they are they increase the fitness of no i'm not sure yeah and but, they, they have a high fitness so they get reproduced a lot yeah and then they become popular and then yeah, yeah but basically like the way society has progressed the past like thousand years th the past few thousand years is because of um, like passing on cultural ideas. Because if we did not do that, we would be in the same place as we were when we were like, you know, hunters and gatherers, mm -hmm. or even before that. So, do you think memes only exist in humans? Um, no. no there, I think there is like some form of culture in animals as well. Because I'm pretty sure I don't know if I can give a specific example, but I think in like apes and some other animals the mothers do teach the children certain um ways of hunting or ways of social behavior that do not get passed on through genes they get passed on through teaching mm -hmm. yeah. so so maybe you could consider that consider that culture as well yeah because That's, it gets passed on but not is. through genes mm, interesting i feel like memes now are so on the uh, internet uh, as, as normal memes as kind of the memes that we talk about in the sense of um uh, i get uh, images funny images they just go so fast we have such an <laughs> accelerated yeah. uh into exchange of ideas especially because of the internet it's such a weird yeah culture changes very rapidly these uh, like compared to 10 years ago it's totally different you know yeah. The yeah, then you could have internet. one uh, funny image and that would be recycled for two years. Yeah. <laughs> Ten years ago. <laughs> and it's like interesting that like with a lot of memes nowadays, everyone is always like, why did this become a meme? Yeah. No and one understands it, yet everyone uses it. And it's popular for a week. Yeah. But that's actually a very interesting point because like normal genetics, you see the point. You see them kind of, they, ha they have to adapt to the specific uh, circumstance that exists. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Yeah. So I guess to the material conditions to say that word again, um, there is this kind of this uh, scary natural world out there, and we need to uh, survive. Yeah. So we have to evolutionally. Or basically, how that works is people have mutations, and some mutations happen to be yeah, mutations, yeah. some don't. Yeah. So yeah, that's how that works. But why do, but then kind of the purpose of internet memes in that kind of frame of evolutionary thought doesn't seem to make much sense. Okay, of course, there are kind of mutations of the different things and some hook on and some don't. But it seems kind of like this unhinged, random, um, random just, ideas yeah. just popping up for no reason. But we are completely enveloped in it. Everybody yeah. knows these memes. Everybody understands them, talks about them. They really change culture and they really change the way we think about the world. But they're so... Yeah, just There's, how it's so it dumb. also influences. <laughs> no, but it also influences Fucking real frog. world, uh, uh, real world uh, events, mm. like the the Trump and Hillary, uh, like no joke. Yeah, that was usually Very influenced by uh, memes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Like Hillary had the Pokemon go to the polls, which may have plummeted her uh, <laughs> votes actually, Maybe. and mm. also Trump. Uh, in a way, he uh, was able to promote his memes. Uh, one meme of it being, make America great again. You could yeah. see that as a meme. That is something that... It was just, used as a meme. A lot. Yeah. In, it was used as a meme. And not only that, it's also something that sticks with you. It's easy and it gets repeated. Mm -hmm. It gets uh, spread in that way. So in that way, he was able to use memes to his advantage very effectively. Like insanely effectively. Mm -hmm. That's like kind of a more, uh, I guess, pointed example where people actually see, okay, memes I can use to for my political campaign, and that's why I want to um, them to. <laughs> why are we talking about memes? <laughs> this is so philosophical. <laughs> it is. It doesn't have to be philosophical. <laughs> it just has to be funny. Anything can be philosophical. Yeah, even memes. <laughs> but I guess I guess it's just scary to think that there are these kind of funny images on the internet can change the culture so much when there's just this unhinged evolution going yeah. on. It goes so rapidly where in one week you have like an entirely different internet culture. Yeah, but maybe it seems like it's like un not understandable why certain images that are super random and strange get popular. But I feel like somehow there is like, the internet does kind of have a taste. Mm -hmm. Like there can be a random image that people are like, yeah, but it's not funny. Definitely. And Or there can be a random image. Like it's, no one knows where that like boundary. where that comedy boundary lies but it does exist i feel mm. like because some get chosen and some don't and but it does also change per community and per generation yeah that's true yeah because if we look at memes from like 2011 like the troll face or whatever <laughs> we're like why was that funny i don't know but in that period of time it was funny it was but, but you can't really say that about genetic in a sense. Because that they, they were funny? <laughs> <laughs> well, <they're kind> of <laughs> Genetics back then, they were not that funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, but they, not funny now, but they were back in the past. But then you can say like, oh, okay, well, there was this kind of specific structure of organisms existing, so we had to behave in this certain way so yeah. we could survive, so we would be fit. And then the funniness of meme <laughs> doesn't really have any use other than being funny. Uh, yeah, well, but that no, is no, a use. But that, that, is, that is the way they compete. They compete for being funny and being funny is, in this case, like the fitness. Mm. The How, reason the, they they go viral. The reason they are shared is because they are funny. Mm -hmm. Then you send it to someone. As their like evolutionary um, advantage, being yeah. funny. Yeah, but I think you could apply it to genes because, like, we have certain like systems in us right now that date back to like the hunter gatherer time or before that i'm not sure well i mean we also have systems that date back to worms it's to worms exactly but a lot of those systems are not but a lot of those systems are not very useful in like current society such as um certain like this was what my paper was about certain like fight flight freeze reactions that are not very handy in our current society like when we see a car passing by like back in the hunter gatherer time that would be very scary to just see a giant like very fast vehicle going back past then you would of course have like a freeze fight fight reaction but nowadays you don't need that but like we, we are still biologically wired to because it's in our genes like that 
So, like, I guess in that way, I don't know. So memes interact with genes. <laughs> also, yeah. Memes and genes change each other. Whoa. Yes. What a nice note to end on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I was just thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, you're, you're right. I think the the final sentence memes and genes change each other <laughs> just like philosophy and science <laughs> <laughs> it went full circle i feel like a lot of this conversation has been about showing kind of the interdependency of a lot of things yeah plus right? science and philosophy phenomenology and scientific. Everyone, everything is connected just like schizophrenia thinking <laughs> That's what we've been doing all this time. We've been schizophrenic. Well, I hope the loser is proud. <laughs> I think he is. And on that note, with <laughs> proud the loser, Papa, I'll see you next time. Papa. <laughs>